For me, it was the Eric Garner case. As most of you probably know at this point, I'm some sort of hodgepodge of different races. Mainly my dad's family is black and my mom's family is white. If you saw me in person, you'd probably assume I was Middle Eastern or Mediterranean or something. When I was in high school, before the beard, people thought I was Latino. Anyway, I feel like for a lot of America, it's new news, but I've been aware of the racist bent of the authorities and the black community's distrust for the police for most of my life. Growing up, I remember my mom, who's white, going on rants when we would see black men pulled over by the police. Let him go, she would say knowing he'd probably been stopped for some arbitrary reason. I remember my auntie telling a story about when she spotted the notorious Southside rapist back in the 90s based on the sketches she had seen on the news. But when she called in his whereabouts, she could tell the detective wasn't taking her seriously. She believed it was because she sounded like a black woman. I grew up in predominantly white settings as a pretty light-skinned mixed kid, so even though my family is black, it was easy for me to lose sight of the struggle happening in America's black neighborhoods. But I also grew up 15 minutes from the spot Michael Brown was shot by Darren Wilson in summer of 2014. I spent hours at the site. I marched in a few of the controversial protests. All of that effectively took place in my hometown and was personal for me. Based on the evidence presented, I didn't, and I still don't believe that Michael Brown deserved to die that day. And I was angry. But when it really hit home for me was when the Eric Garner video was released where police pinned a man to the concrete and used a chokehold technique that had been banned by the NYPD to apparently subdue him for selling cigarettes illegally. With his face pinned to the sidewalk, Eric Garner repeated the phrase, I can't breathe, over and over again as police held him down, until he died. I wept the first time I watched it. Then again the second time. The third. As a matter of fact, I still weep every time I watch it. Eric was quite literally pleading for his life. You can hear the panic and dread in his voice as he faced the reality that he might die over some cigarettes. But the phrase, I can't breathe, would become something of a mantra for people all over the country calling for police accountability. How poetic of a gift, however heartbreaking, that a man could die while offering the world such a profound truth. That throughout its history, the American political system has been strategically holding its black communities in a chokehold, and in so many vital ways, black America can't breathe. The time to confront the reality of racism is now. The invention of the cell phone cameras made it more tangible than ever that we are not past it, and that actually we have a long way to go. But it seems that in so many ways, the church has taken a back seat on the issue. The current political climate seems to suggest that there's a massive overlap between religious America and racist America. Dr. Martin Luther King famously stated that the most segregated hour in America is 11 a.m. on Sunday morning. So why the culture gap? Now, I fully acknowledge that there are a great number of churches working hard towards racial reconciliation, and a number of them are very effective. But that seems to be the exception to the rule. If God is supposedly using the church to bring about his dream of neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, male nor female, but all be one in Christ, why is the church so often a passive observer, if not a purveyor of the painfully obvious racism in America? On today's episode, we're interviewing our friend Prisca about what it's like to be a black girl growing up in a white church. We'll talk about the effect of microaggressions, the N-word, and how the church's nonchalant approach to race is leading people away from the faith. I'm Chuck Parson, and this is The Life After. Chuck, I want to relive a conversation I had with you this week um, because I feel like it's very important. It needs to be on the air. Um, are you are you ready for this important conversation? Yeah, to, uh, yeah, hit me, Brady. <laughs> well, I realized how different our hosting styles are, okay. and I I think I figured out the key are of, we, of who we are. We're different. We're very different. Yeah, you and I. <sighs> yeah. So I realized that I um, am kind of more like a late night host. Where I want to, I want to, you know. <laughs> Crack the wise and make the jokes. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and crack, crack the wise. <laughs> crack the wise. Yeah. I think it was from Community. Okay. Um, and actually, a couple months before I I started this podcast, I was thinking to myself, I really want to do something in the podcast realm because I that's something I'm really interested in. Um, 
And I, I thought it'd be interesting to have a late night show where I just interview my friends as if they were celebrities. Mm-hmm. And so I kind of feel like that's what this is, but we it's, all just talk about I like it. one of the same subjects. Right. How, instead, of, instead of talking about our movies, we talk about our trauma. <laughs> and it's so, Isn't it so much so more interesting? interesting? We're basically Conan. Yeah, basically Conan. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> so Jim Carrey, um, tell me about the time your dad abused you. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. like really heavy it's sort stuff of like, like that. Yeah, it's like that. Uh, disclaimer: I don't know if Jim Carrey's dad ever abused them. What would you say your hosting is like? Um, I'm, I'm more like uh, this. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, Chuck Parson, and this is This American Life. Um, on our first act today, we're speaking with Brady Harden. He has, uh, <laughs> he's experienced some trauma in the church life. Yeah, I'm basically Ira Glass, except like a little bit edgier, you know, because yeah. he's like the least edgy person ever, but in like the edgiest way possible, you know, I don't know if that makes sense, but I really like Ira Glass. <laughs> <laughs> I love uh, it. No, no, my whole approach is like, I listen to, I listen to almost exclusively like NPR and Radiotopia uh, podcasts. Which yeah, what like podcasts awesome. do you listen to? What are your favorites? Um, I love, I mean, I love This American Life. I love... Song Exploder is one of my favorite, Radiotopia. Mm-hmm. Um, I love Radio Lab. That's another NPR show. Because um, you got me into some of this brain when we went to Nashville. Great. On the way home, I was. Yeah, yeah, really yeah. I, all this. I, I sort like, of like exposed you to my yes. podcast world. And you like were the, into the it. more intelligent side. Right. Of the world. <laughs> right. I've never been here before. Right, right. right. Yeah, because yeah, you, you listen to mostly comedy podcasts. Well, my, uh, my big ones are Comedy Bang Bang. Um, right. Mark Maron is a big one that and I love. Yeah, um, All I also, good, both good ones. I realize there's this other show that really influenced me called Mysterious Universe. It's these two yeah. Aussie guys talking about supernatural things. And like they don't believe in it or not. You never really know. Right. But um, I just love to hear them talk about weird stuff on the news right, and Bigfoot right. and everything like that. I don't believe in Bigfoot. What? Or maybe I do. I don't know. Hey, man, uh, have, have faith. <laughs> Bigfoot loves you. Bigfoot is real because Bigfoot says he's real, right? Uh, so all I have to do is jump in and that circular reasoning. I could be there if forever. If you don't give your 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 heart and your uh, and your Stop. life to Bigfoot, you could wind up in a Bigfoot hell. Yeah, yeah. You need Absolutely. to be careful. <laughs> Absolutely. It's Pascal's wager. Mm. You know, if there is no Bigfoot and you and you accept that there is Bigfoot, this is amazing. This is gonna really then deep. you're fine. Mm-hmm. If there is a big, if there is no Bigfoot and you and you believe in Bigfoot, <laughs> you're also fine. Thank you, Ira. If there is no Bigfoot, <laughs> I'm done. I'm done. I can't even. <laughs> anyway, I just, I really we call this uh, Parsons wager. Par- I like that. Yeah, I like that. It's my version of the flying spaghetti monster. Mm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um. Anyway, I just, I, I really came to appreciate how different our hosting styles are, and I, I like that. I think, I think we. We compliment yeah. each other, but you know, it's so indicative of our friendship because back when we were Christians, you know, I was very much a Calvinist and you're very much not. And yes. we've always just been like, we come to yeah. this, we always end up in I the same fun. place, but different directions from different directions. Right. Yeah. With theology, you were boring and I had fun. And now and we flipped. with the podcast, you have fun and I'm boring. I think Calvinism is very interesting and very exciting. <sighs> if you want to interpret the entire Bible through like three passages, sure. <laughs> It's great. It's hilarious. <laughs> hilarious is the I, word. Um, no, I, I think that it's by the lens that you see everything else. Uh, no, I, I, three passages. Give me a break. Uh, Give me a break. Oh, so where can you been, find free will? We've been working uh, on this. Uh, we've been working on this. Uh, this segment that where where me and Brady are going <laughs> to pseudo argue uh, our different worldviews. We're from. coming back. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. So that was just a little preview. It <laughs> was a little preview. <laughs> get, it's going to get a little heated. It is. We need to make like um like boxing match posters and everything. It's going to be amazing. Yep. Absolutely. Um, another thing I wanted to talk to you about. We yep. got an email um, from somebody who is still a Christian. And uh, I wanted to kind of address one of the questions they had uh, for us. And that question was, uh, from their observation, it seems that a lot of us who have left the faith have left because of um, situations that start off with trauma. The trauma, some big bad thing that happens in our lives. Right. Okay. okay. Yeah, I saw this email. Was kind of yeah. the, the, the catalyst for us walking out. Um, and his viewpoint was that maybe we did not have a strong enough theology of pain or theology of right. suffering yeah. um, and felt that maybe we 
left the faith or something out of um, lack of strength or confidence or bravery or courage. I, I don't. Or, or maybe just faith. maybe just like uh, maybe just a, on a very basic level of theological understanding. There, you go. I think right? that's fair to say. I think is sort of where he was coming from. So I know he, how I think, I, w- he, I think he used the phrase. Uh, a theology of pain. A theology of pain. That's what, what that's said. what stuck out of my head as yeah. well. Um, so I know how I would answer that. Do you have you given thought? How would you answer that? I yeah, I have so many answers for that. I'm interested in hearing yours first, so maybe you can. Okay. Maybe I don't. Maybe I won't be so redundant. Um, well, my thing is, I I had a very good understanding of a theology of pain and suffering as a Calvinist. That's something that we really we focused on a lot. Um, I even wrote, you know, the the novel. That I that I wrote and that was a huge theme in it and I was also writing the sequel up to the point that um, my wife left and uh, that was a huge 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 theme in that in the second book um, so no I I had a I understanding and also I'd gone through a lot of trauma throughout my life mm-hmm. um, what brought me closer to Christianity was the fact that my you know I came from an abusive home my dad was abusive he cheated got a divorce um, so being that uh, the kid in the church who was going through divorce was what actually brought me to God um, in that way. But what happened for me mm-hmm. was was yeah. the Holy Spirit, is that I, I lost faith in what my theology of the Holy Spirit. My understanding of the Holy Spirit biblically was that um, the the very presence of God, the, the Spirit of God, lives in the hearts of people, um, and he sanctifies them as they um, grow in their faith from the inside out, causing them to sin less, to become more like him, to become more godly. Um, and that's also through the washing of the word. So th- those were, the, that was my understanding. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. but then when I came to the situation with, um, with the church that, uh, left that, well, that I got kicked out of, I was very confused on, um, how that would happen if they had the Holy spirit of how they continually could, make these decisions and treat a certain person that way, even though they were told what the truth was and, and how things were going. Um, and then I also saw a lot of other attitudes that kind of came with that. I think what I'm saying is if I were to objectively walk into a group of, of Christians or a Christian culture, um, there would be nothing that I would see that would be different about them that would make me say there has to be some sort of external force changing these people. There has to be some sort of third party mm-hmm. that is um, changing um, people's situations or who they are, their personalities or uh, moral, whatever. Sure. Um, yeah, yeah. So for me, the the first thing to go was my belief in the Holy Spirit, that there is a connection that's, that's um, convicting people and making rights out of wrongs and knowing mm-hmm. that all rights and wrongs need to be waited till you know the end of the of of days or whatever. Um, but within the Christian community, I was very confused because I was not seeing any fruits of the Holy Spirit that I was not that was exclusive to that community. Um, because I could look out and I can see people that are non Christians that are growing, that are becoming more moral, that are being more mindful of who they are, of right. growing, of self growth, and all of that. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But they didn't have the Holy Spirit, so I, I didn't see a, a big difference. That was kind of what was kind of the catalyst for me, not the right. suffering um, as much as understanding this isn't how I was, this isn't how I expected it. This isn't what I was taught. Sure. It yeah, my yeah, experience yeah. and my head knowledge were not connecting. Right, right, right. right. No. Yeah. It seems like outside of the church, there's a, there's more capacity to, uh, to heal, right. To, yeah. to, to alleviate suffering or understand suffering than there is within Christian theology, right? Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, I actually, I spent a lot of time um, exploring the the problem of suffering because I was, you know, uh, I think any, like, <clears throat> I think any thinker, like somebody that spends a lot of time in their head bouncing ideas around is going to have a really, really hard time uh, accepting Christian doctrine with, you know, against the problem of suffering. It's like there are books and books written on this, right? Um so I, I spent a lot of time on that question, and um, I, there were a few answers that I liked and, and a lot of ones that I didn't like. Um, C.S. Lewis famously sort of attributes it to, to free will, right? Mm-hmm. Like humans have the choice to be good or bad, so they do bad things, and it results in other people feeling, you know, getting hurt or whatever, which of course doesn't account for the worst things that we experience in life, like the death of a child or you know, uh, an earthquake that kills 800,000 Haitians or, you know, things like that. Like that has nothing to do with human free will, right? This is right, just, right. Th- there's just things that happen. Things that Cancer, happen. you know, mm-hmm. the biggest problems aren't, aren't addressed there. Um, 
my favorite Christian explanation for suffering was actually from, and I don't really know where she derived her theology, but um, a Christian author named Anne Voskamp. Um, okay. She's okay. Like she's, you know, she's pretty cool. She's a little bit, uh, she's a little bit of a hippie, I think. So that kind of bothers me, but she was <laughs> no offense to any hippies out there. You guys are cool. Um, but she wrote a book called 1000 gifts and the, the, uh, sort of the, the theology that she approaches is that, um, is that everything that, that comes to you in life. And this is sort of a, this is a sort of a Calvinistic thing. She makes some okay. references. Um, everything that comes to you in life is sort of ordained, right? So, um, so the, the key to dealing with suffering and dealing with the theological problems with suffering is to be thankful, is to, is to be. Uh, is to practice gratitude, right? So mm. wake up, uh, thank God for for whatever is going on, and uh, there's some there's some validity to that, right? I mean, like obviously it disregards the the human the very guttural human emotions of suffering, right? Yeah, and that's why my my, my f- I see your yeah, yeah see my your brow is like, like no, I'm like, very contorted. Like, like I don't know how I feel about reject this. this. You're yeah. the Calvinist. Um, I was, I was <laughs> past tense. Come right, on. Right, right, right. Um, uh, but th- that was, that was the one that I found most effective because it forced me to, um, to sort of, to sort of, as a Christian, look at, at what was happening and say like, okay, um, like this has a purpose, which I no longer believe that suffering has a purpose. Right? Yeah. It's just, things are random in my worldview chaos is, Which is, understandable. is pretty much yeah. what runs everything but and while i was a christian it was like okay this, this it forced me to practice gratitude which really does make the world brighter right mm-hmm. like if you just take some time to think like what what is good about this and what can i embrace and what have i learned and 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 what is where has this gotten me right um so that was like cool but ultimately they all sort of to me end in this circular reasoning right so uh, most Christian explanations for suffering say like something like God, ultimately they end up saying like God allows you to suffer so that you can learn from that suffering and in turn help people that are suffering. Right. Yeah. Which is great. And that's, that's actually a true thing that happens, right? We like mm-hmm. experience suffering and then we're able to sympathize with people it's that are suffering. The man met the hero's journey. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So, but the problem with that is that if suffering didn't exist in the first place, then we wouldn't have to suffer in order to help people right. that are suffering. Right, right. And then you're like, well, who do we blame for suffering? Well, there's an omnipotent being that just decided that it's okay for <laughs> suffering to happen. Yeah. Right. So it's it doesn't it doesn't make sense. I mean, it doesn't break down ultimately. Like, uh, why introduce suffering at all in the first place if? Uh, you know, if the whole, if the only purpose of it is to then alleviate the suffering that didn't really need to exist in the yeah. first place. And, and of I course, have, I have, you know, I have issue with that. Of course, people are going to have answers. Um, yeah. There's always answers to, um, but, but it's whether or not those can really, you allow yourself to really sink your teeth into them. And if they're, <laughs> you know, they're worth chewing on. Right. Um, it, and I would say also to, to that, to that email, like there is, like suffering, that's an oversimplification, I think, for everyone yeah. that's been on the show is to say that a bad thing happened and they decided they didn't believe it. And that's, God. that was my family. It's coupled with, it's always coupled with, is the Bible an accurate right. document? Is, is what Christian doctrine teaches, does that line up with my experience and my, like what I see in life? I'm a, I'm a, I'm a very, very happy, to use Christian language, joyful person now on a level that I never was when I was a Christian because I don't think that the, the Christian worldview is conducive to allowing you to love yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's just, I, I understand that that's Mandarin to people that are still in the system, but yeah, it's um, very true. It's, it's hard to explain, but that's my experience. So it, it's, it's way more complicated than I, Oh, my marriage didn't work. So I'm angry at God. And I right. Left. And that was kind of my, my family's, I think initial response to me was, Oh, you didn't get your way. So you, you've left it right yeah we kind of addressed that on the first yeah. the first and it's episode. like there's so much more to what's going on in my head in my experience um but but another thing about the holy spirit that i talked about earlier was i i always have a question and this is going to bring us to our guest today um always have had a question about why is it that people who claim to have the holy spirit um generally generally speaking i know i'm making generalizations here are are historically behind the times on social issues Yes. Um, when it comes to uh, the treatment of people of color, when it comes to the treatment of women, um, and more recently the, the LGBTQ um, yeah. AI plus community of just mm-hmm. 
they're always behind and they're the hindrance for progress right. is that we all know it's going to end up happening, that they're going to be accepted. And eventually it's going to be part of the conscious of Christians mm-hmm. to protect the people that right now, the majority of them are not uh, protecting. Right. Um, and there's the same with women. It was the same with people of color um, of, of all of these different things. And so, um, and that was that was kind of in the news this week. Sorry, I don't want to cut you off. Yeah, um, I, I think the Southern Baptist Convention um, made a made like had to make like a, a actual stance on the alt right. On the alt right, yes. And, but it was not until like up until about two years ago that they made a decision of not flying the Confederate flag. Right. Um, like right, I think right, it was right. like in the year of 2015 that that decision was finally made. Yeah. I mean, um, it is the Southern. Baptist right. convention exactly but founded still to defend slavery right but true but it but also the the point is if the holy spirit the actual presence of god is changing these people from the inside out um is the holy spirit a xenophobe is the holy spirit not right right or are these people for whatever reason pushing against um what they should be feeling and what they should be, because it's not just an equal thing if, if you look at the church and to non-christians it's not an equal ratio of people yeah. who are pro or against these things the the being against this progress of social change is usually the viewpoint of people who claim and have the holy spirit and yeah. not the viewpoint of those who don't and eventually right. who wins out the ones who don't and that becomes the norm and things that right now if i were to go into a church and start racially attacking uh, people of color or sexistly, you know, beating a woman, they would stand up and they would fight against it. Yes. You know, and, I, and I'm using extreme, I'm using extreme examples, right, right, obviously, right, sure. but um, that's not how it always would have been. Right. And um, our yeah. guest today um, is a friend of mine, Prisca, and I'm going to let her tell you um, all how we know each other because she could probably tell the story better than I can. Um, but Prisca is um, black She's a playwright. She's extremely talented. And uh, I want to talk to her today about um, arts and culture and also yes. uh, what it was like being a person of color growing up in the church. Yeah. Um, we'll have Prisca right after this. Cool. The Life After Facebook page is a great way to get in touch with other religion survivors. Also, we like to post interesting articles on there. And it's a good way to get a hold of us. And you won't need a concordance to find us. <laughs> we- <laughs> We have a link to the Facebook page on our website, thelifeafter.org, or search The Life After on Facebook. Finally, you could just go to our URL, facebook.com slash thelifeafterorg. Okay, so Jesus was black, Donald Trump was the devil, and the Bible was written by a patriarchal society. So I'm done. <laughs> Are we good? Is that is that all we needed? Everybody, all right. Yeah, we're... Yeah, I think that we I think that's it. it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We're it. We've got a party to get to. So. Thanks, thanks. That's great. I would like to welcome my friend Prisca. Love welcome to the show. Hi. Thanks for having me. <laughs> welcome to the show, Prisca. Um, how long have we known each other? How do we meet? Oh, gosh. So when was completing Caden written or uh, done? That was oh, is that how you guys know each other? Yeah, yeah. 2005. Oh, okay. Yo, yeah. 2005. Been, it's been 12 years. Yeah, yeah. It's been 12 years. Does anybody baby. that was on that show still <laughs> believe in Christianity? Yeah, a couple. Um, really? Mm-hmm. The one who wrote it, uh, the, the executive producer does. Okay. And uh, Dick Wolf. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's honest. That's all I can think of off the top of my head. Okay. Um, so yeah, the, the cable Christian sitcom, um, yeah. how did you come into contact with that? So it's actually really funny. Um, I had written, um, a script myself about, uh, uh that kind of issue about, um, Christian teens being persecuted and all that stuff, you know, in school. Cause poor us, we're always persecuted in school and everything. <laughs> But so I wrote a script about that mm-hmm. and uh, my mother happened to find your series on on the internet and so she oh, sent wow. it to me. She was like, "Oh my gosh, this is what you wrote about." And I watched it and at the time I was like still watching a lot of Christian art along with secular art. So when I saw it, I I was able to see this piece of art for what it was. Um, which was it was Christian art and so it was definitely for somebody like me so I appreciated it would I have shown it to (laughs) it's so bad (laughs) (laughs) would I have 
would I have shown it to like you know um, my a, a my, cool person? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like no. on a date. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> probably not. Look at this really underwhelming thing my friends made. <laughs> I'm just kidding. So, right, right. I mean, but I, then we became kind of pen pals in a weird way because yeah. you you would comment on the message board or something. Mm-hmm. And I'd, I'd comment responded. on the message board. It was MySpace back in the back yes. in the yeah, back yeah, yeah, in yeah. the dark. <laughs> it was my you know we'd comment on MySpace mm, yes. and stuff and I eventually made a road trip with some friends out to the season two premiere oh my goodness and that's when we met in person was brady ever in your top eight yeah he was oh, actually. oh <laughs> importante <laughs> all right is this is real okay I, I get it I, I did not know this oh yeah. my god yeah brady yes. and the other the other guy the guy who played caden oh really uh-huh. oh we're both very very gay I'm yeah sorry. oh i know yeah. <laughs> i think last time i uh, saw you or, or or like two trips ago I saw you I I uh, we were having drinks and I asked I was like so that guy he's gay right I was like oh yeah I have that third eye <laughs> that's that's amazing so um yeah we met through that that is mm-hmm. that's so crazy mm-hmm. <laughs> so Prisca mm-hmm. you uh you grew up in correct me if I'm wrong a, a white suburban church. Yeah. Um, so I grew up high school wise. I grew up um, in Lawrence, Kansas. And Lawrence is what's known as the blue dot in a sea of red. Right. Wow. And right. So okay. I was, yeah. I actually had like a pretty opposite experience of a lot of people who are going to be on this show. I was, I was the, I was the, uh, Christian person in like liberal town, college town, USA okay. and stuff. So you were, you were a tiny red dot in a bigger blue dot. Yeah. In a much bigger <laughs> red. Dot. So I was actually more of a purple. I didn't realize this till later. I was more of a purple dot because okay. My, okay. My, my mother still raised me. She was like, Oh, you know, I'm going to raise you in, in in the white church but you you know you um we still think this way because because we are black and okay. so, I, like and yeah, yeah, <laughs> I was sure. like okay yeah. <laughs> yes mother so I was, like, <laughs> right. <laughs> that right. was like a purple dot <laughs> but um while in lawrence um i went to like i hopped with my uh, friends to three different youth groups um, basically, whenever the youth pastor would quit, we would just leave the youth group and find another one. Okay. And it was kind of like that constant thing. And um, so I was in Lawrence. And meanwhile, we on Sundays, I went to church in a, in a Grandview at a place called Metro. And that was the big, like, massive church. When I was there, Mike Bickle was still there. Um, and uh, Metro was... Um, Metro was the church that gave birth to House of Prayer. And so when I was oh. there... Oh, okay, okay, okay. So yes. very charismatic background. Uh, very charismatic. Okay. I grew up knee yeah, deep. I know some, I know the, and now that you say that, I know that name, right? Yeah. Yeah, I, I grew up like like knee deep in like the charismatic world. And even, even in Lawrence, I found my charismatic churches and stuff. Mm-hmm. And I will say this, it's so funny. Like when I was first introduced to the charismatic world, um, I was so excited because church up until I was 12 years old kind of bored me except for camp. Um, I guess I, I went to church camp for like 12 years. Um, but I was like, this is really, I don't, I don't, I'm bored. I, I don't want to sing. I'm really mm-hmm. bored. And then uh, my first day at Metro, there was an entire group of people up front just jumping right, and like right, dancing right. around and like yeah. pounding their fists. And I'm like, this is the greatest thing ever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I found it. I found my place. You it's needed like that expression. Yeah. 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 I needed that. And um, yeah. And I was just really excited about it. So. I've always thought of charismatics as like if you're like in a fantasy film, they're always like the wizard. Because mm-hmm. like you all have magic and stuff. Like you've got mm-hmm. powers. Right. We right, didn't right. have that. We were just like, hey, yeah. I want to go read a book and, you mm-hmm. know, whatever. But right. yeah. No, right. you guys had magic powers. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. The thing, I, I don't think, I don't know if a lot of like, like christians realize this and and like but there's like some blackness to pentecostalism like there are black roots mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. to pentecostalism roots so. absolutely yeah re- okay brady <laughs> so fun fact <laughs> nice actually, try it's actually even funny um there's like <laughs> but that's like but that to me is like where that's where that sense of soul and that sense of like that dance and the in mm-hmm. the, mm-hmm. the, the and the loudness you know what i mean like that all 
comes from black culture and uh i think that kind of gets overlooked when i think of a pentecostal i think of a white lady in a skirt with a bun you know what i mean but yeah that's not the, really that's the not always that's, that's not, not always right. right and it's actually it's even funny um with within the, the pentecostal world so in in my mind too i have the pentecostal world and the charismatic world and they're basically like the same thing they're like they're like sisters but um uh, one you one the pentecostal world you have to wear a skirt and yeah. charismatic world, you can wear jeans. Yes. And that's yes. basically right. That's the big difference. <laughs> that's the big difference. Yeah. It, it is weird but, looking back at how much religion um, had to do with how people dressed. Oh, my God. Yeah. Like, it hit every single aspect of people's yeah. lives, you know? It, it's just yeah. weird to think of that. Like, there is a time where I can, like, look at a religious person be able to tell you what denomination they probably yeah. were just yeah, because yeah. of how oh, sure. different those cultures are. And I don't know if you guys know this, but fun fact. Um, uh, so Pentecostal, the two big groups, there is the Assembly of God Church. Yeah. And then yes. there's uh, Kojic, a.k.a. the Church of God in Christ. Okay. Mm. Um, I'm not familiar with that one. Okay. They, uh, Kojic is the black church. Okay. Well, that's probably why I'm not that's, familiar yeah. with it. And, and um, Assembly of God is the white church. They did this on purpose um, because no. there was se- there was segregation. Yeah. Both no, churches it. were founded during segregation. And so... Uh, basically, I think it was the African American group that they're like, well, we need a, we w- we want a church to go to, so they founded the, tr- mm-hmm. the Church of God in Christ, and uh, uh, so I believe the Assembly of God was the first one to be like to start, and they were like, you can't stay here, or you can stay here, but you have to stay up in the balcony, and eventually they um, Kojic took their um, claimed wow. their power and they formed their own. So that's why one of the many reasons why it's so segregated. But I was actually... I, I did not know that. hmm Yep. Oh, yeah. But I was uh, actually raised in a predominantly white church and with, like, I think, like, depending on, like, the size of the church, like, sometimes I was the only person, sometimes I was, like, one of ten, depending. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That was, I mean, uh, I had a, I mean, I'm obviously a lot lighter skinned than you, but my, my family is black. My dad's black. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I was, I always joked in high school, I was, I was one of I was there were two and a half black people in my class Mm -hmm. and I was the half Mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. it was sort of like I totally I I resonate with that experience to a degree I mean most people look at me and they see enough of a white guy that they put me in that category Mm -hmm. so I'm like I can be the token like white you know what I mean and and uh and people make like half black jokes a lot and it's 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 whatever (laughs) but um but yeah no I, I I understand that it's like oh you don't understand it's this huge part of my life. Like nobody in this scenario gets that right. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Prisca, you, you had shared with me, um, before what your experience was growing up in the white church, like what kind of attention did you get that you didn't want or that you did want or however, what was that like? Um, just kind of being singled out. Yeah. Well, I resonated, uh, a lot with Chuck's story too. Cause, uh, I think, well, church or no church when you're growing up you you just want to survive you just want to fit in and survive and so you're like what's my bit my yes. bit is i'm this right and so i was actually usually the first person to like make a joke about my race mm. um about me being black like oh, i'm the black girl like right um and then as a result um and it's funny looking back on this actually because a lot of these jokes that were made if I had a kid, I would be livid, absolutely right, livid. Right, um, right, right. One, I, there were a lot of jokes made about my skin color. Like, for example, somebody once um, held up um, a, a black piece of paper to my skin and said, "Hey, look, it's the same thing." And I was like, "Ha ha ha ha!" Um, yeah. A lot of times, because uh, you because you seem you 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 seem hostile if you don't laugh, right? You yes. seem like you're mean mm-hmm. if you don't laugh. Yeah. And like, know. oh, she's just leave her alone. She's mean. Yeah. You know, she didn't get my joke. Right. right? Even it was just a joke. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, I got the uh, um, a lot at camp. I got whenever it was nighttime, um, somebody would be like, Prisca, where are you? Like, especially especially right. if I was praying, if I was praying, my eyes were closed. Prisca, where are you? And then I would like smile and then it would say, there you are. Oh, my gosh. Boom, yeah, boom, yeah, boom. Yeah. 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 <laughs> See, I had... <laughs> hysterical yeah i had a revelation um when you were talking about this earlier and when i was listening to your recording of i do this a lot 
And to me, the punchline is, well, we all know Brady's not racist, so this is funny. But, like, that's not a punchline. So, like, I legitimately had, like, a moment of guilt and shame when I was thinking about how I... Because I make jokes with Chuck and other people with their race. And they'll laugh, and I'll think, okay, well, that's that's fine. I got permission to do this shit. But that's not the case. Um, I learned that this week. It's a, and it's I'm a sorry. challenging. That's huge, I'm actually, sorry. because yeah. uh, you know, no, yeah. it's it, you know, it's it's. I mean, the of uh, uh, in the great in the grand scheme of of racial offenses that have been cast upon us, uh, that's that's not a big deal. Yeah. True, <laughs> and I I do appreciate that you acknowledge that. Um, and it, that's a hard thing uh, for. Uh, I think maybe we were talking to Zach about this uh, d- when we were recording his episode, but it was like a side thing. And he said like, you know, it's, it's a hard thing to, to be like, I'm racist. I'm probably racist because I'm white. Mm-hmm. And it's really, really hard in our culture to be white and not be racist yeah. because no matter how much you believe and r- repeat the rhetoric that everybody's equal, there are all kinds of, of, of very small or very big ways that you can uh, that you can perpetuate the idea that we're not right. So well, and that and that and other that's pod- that I think is the problem with most churches. Yeah, absolutely. Most people in most churches, unless you're in the deep South, are gonna say that they're not racist. Yeah. They're very anti-racist. Everybody's equal. They believe that really. But, they believe that really strongly. But there are all these little ways. Yeah. Well, I actually um, I learned a word last week it's called it's called microaggression oh yeah and because yes. i was trying to figure out like why am i so because for the most part my uh, church life wasn't awful why am i so sensitive about these little things and it's these microaggressions um and basically a microaggression is kind of a statement or just like a thought or like something uh, something that happens to you that is not a big deal on paper but over time it bears down on you over and over it's like it's like a paper cut yeah and one is fine two on on the same spot okay three and then over and over and over again they have this huge wound yes and then and then you know if you're like me you're like yelling at your friend of like five years about how racist he is that happened (laughs) right (laughs) that happened because i was like this isn't these jokes aren't funny didn't come out and say like oh yeah richard spencer he's my dude yeah. No, yeah. he right. just are they, you know, just mm-hmm. did you know, some things over time. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I always think of so this is actually really poignant because a lot of it's it's like a cool thing in, in like bro conservatism to make fun of microaggressions because it's it mm-hmm. sounds like a oh, we're just sensitive little liberal snowflakes, right? <laughs> uh but there's so much truth to it and I, I always think of this episode of Everybody Loves Raymond, which is, you know, a very <laughs> mediocre show. My mom loves it. She's yeah. watched every episode like 30 <laughs> times. So I'm very familiar with the, the chronology of the show. But there's this episode where it's a flashback and they're, they're, they're discussing where they're going to live as a married couple. Mm-hmm. And she really wants to live across the street from his parents. And he's like, that's a terrible idea. Mm-hmm. And then he flicks her on the nose and she's like, ow, that was annoying. And he flicks her on the nose again and he's like, <laughs> She's like, what are you doing? And he's like, that's not so bad right now, is it? It's kind of annoying. And then he's like, but what if I just kept flicking you on the nose over (laughs) and over and over and over? And he's trying to explain, you know, like how awful it would be to have all these little annoying instances living across the street from his parents. But it's a really poignant way of of explaining, like, this is what it's like for minorities in, in America. Yes. In general, is there all of these little ways where you get flicked in the nose until you're like, I don't want to be here anymore and I'm livid. Yeah. 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 Now imagine being both a minority and a female. Yeah. I can't even imagine. Yeah. Yeah. Like, and also the frustrating thing too is, you know, I've known about the word microaggressions for a very long time, but then you come to different consciousness of how guilty you are of them. Yeah. You know, um, I was listening to another podcast in Visibilia and they had, a, they had an episode on racism and just like they, it, it's, it's all about invisible things that affect culture and society. Mm-hmm. And this one was about racism. And there was a guy who um, had adopted a black girl and has been raising her to, to be aware of these things. Right. And then he found himself in a situation where he was prejudiced against someone like right off the bat, just like mm-hmm. saw them down the street and, you know, assumed a certain thing. 
And they interviewed him about that, and he just broke down crying, like harder than I've heard adult men cry before. Um, and there's also in there like a, a group that's like a um, Alcoholics Anonymous, but for racism, mm. and in all these different mm. things. That's it was so it was great. an int- cool. is such yeah. a good episode. If you guys get a chance to listen mm-hmm. to it, I highly recommend it. Um, but you know what? Uh, there is a story that you have told me um, that I want to get. Did I want you to tell one of Regan Bax from the break? Yeah, um, it involves the N word and mm-hmm. a lot of attention that you do not want. Um, so wait for after the break, and when we get back, Preska is going to tell us the story. Extra, extra, read all about it. Why are you trying to sell a newspaper on our podcast? I'm not. I'm telling our listeners about the blog. Did you know that the podcast is only one of the themes that we produce? Yes. We also have a blog on thelifeafter.org, posts about starting over after religious trauma. But don't you think you're being a little extra? I am extra. And you can read all about it on thelifeafter.org. Ba-dum, bum. Welcome back. Um... Before we left on the break, uh, Prisca, I was kind of setting you up to tell us a story that um, you had shared with me that's very important about your yeah <laughs> realization of your place in this world. Yes. Yeah. So when I was like, well, actually, backstory. Um, I started going to the uh, youth front camps when I was like, gosh, I think 10 years old. And every every summer, that was my spot. That was my place. I loved it. That was my place to just like you know run and be free and be me it was like it was super fun super great like there were some rules and stuff but like other than that I really enjoyed it um so first you were a camper and then if you wanted to you could uh once you got older old enough you could be um what's called teen staff and teen staff is the volunteer like um is the volunteer staff they're the ones who um actually they do all the all the all the cooking and cleaning and Mm -hmm. and all that stuff but like on downtime, we just kind of hang out like almost all summer. So it was this really great experience. Mm-hmm. I got a really good um, community out of it. Um, there were two black people, three black people that summer. Um, one was on staff and then me and Janai were on teen staff. So, yeah, for the most part, it was it was just like either me or Janai. We always missed each other except for that, except for like one week. I had never experienced like the blunt racism that I had experienced until this very moment. Mm. Um, we're all like sitting in lunch, like um, wait, waiting for the kids to come in and everything. I was 16. Actually, I was 16 years old. Mm-hmm. We're all, we're all sitting in lunch, waiting for the kids to come in. Somehow everybody gets loud. We all start getting loud. We start laughing and banging and, you know, and screaming and stuff. And it's a fun time. It's a fun time. Everybody's like you do at youth camp, right? Yeah. Yeah, it, it really is. It's a fun time. And like it gets louder and louder and louder. And then suddenly I hear the words, shut up, you niggers. Mm. Silence. Mm-hmm. And I, I had like an array of thoughts in my head. The first one was, I didn't just hear that. Nah, I right, didn't. Right. I like that was a mistake. I didn't hear that. And then I focused in on the people, people at the table because it was a round table. And so, like, it was like everybody was staring at me. I saw everybody just staring at me. Like, wow. And I was like, oh, fuck. Mm. I have to handle this. Oh, 16 year old Prisca has um, to handle this. Very young. Yeah. yeah not, not the staff. I have to handle this. Right. And um, I turned around and I yelled, who said that? Who the fuck said that? Mm. And if I. You both, dropped the F bomb. I dropped the F bomb. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's not all my focus of the story. I mean, he dropped the in bomb. Yeah, exactly. I was going to say. And yours is in response to that. But I love that. It's it's an appropriate response. It is an appropriate word. Mm -hmm. I guess for my question, did anybody call you out on saying the F word? Nah. Thank God. No. Okay. That's at least one redeeming quality of this conversation. Yeah. Uh, No, mm -hmm. they didn't. They were okay. So I said, who the fuck said that? And my friend, uh, Michael, turned around. He turned around and he had... His face was so white. It was so white. Like in more than one way. More than one way. <laughs> thank, yeah. thank you, Chuck. He was just pale. He was so pale. He knew what he did was mm-hmm. wrong. And wow. I, I think I told you this, Brady, but um part of the thing that like hurt me was that he knew what he did was wrong and he was so terrified because he didn't know I was there. Right. And in that point, I had more thoughts. What's worse? Like, he said it because he didn't know I was there. 
so he says it all the time yeah or would it ha- would it have sucked if he knew i was there and he just called me a nigger like right. what what's worse and i don't i don't know what's worse so there's it's, either other way there's a sense of betrayal for sure there was yeah and, and you're friends with him right yeah and have you ever gotten like a racist racist vibe from him no before? so here, here's my here's my thing is even do you think his intention was to be racist i don't care exactly that's the, my that's my point is the fact yeah. that what still happened through that was every single eye was on you you were mm-hmm. completely singled out you're humiliated mm-hmm. and whether or not he had the intention of whatever that word that word had such a power yeah even if he said it neutrally the word had the power yeah and the only one who got pierced by that power was was me, was me. Mm-hmm. and also he knew better because once mm-hmm. again, his his face was just like sheet white. He was terrified when he heard my voice. He knew better. So it wasn't like he was saying this out of like, I don't know what I'm doing. He knew right. what he knew what he was doing. And so it was just kind of like, well, OK, we have to have a conversation. Um, and and that then, was your next step as you had a conversation with him. Yeah, there were. <laughs> it's so funny because it was I was so upset and I was so like, like frazzled that um, there was probably like, um. Let me think about this. Yeah, there were like three, it was like three levels, literal levels of grief, like literal mm. like levels of emotion. Mm-hmm. There was the, so he turned around. Um, he said, I, I said it. And I said, why did you say that? He's like, I don't know in front of everybody. Mm-hmm. And I said, well, don't say that again. He said, mm-hmm. okay. And then we kept eating. And that was, that was quote unquote it. Mm-hmm. And uh, I couldn't eat. I couldn't. I, it, I couldn't right. eat and I just I sat there and I sat there and I sat there and like I felt the tears coming so yeah. um, I threw my food away and I ran to the bathroom and I remember like sitting in the bathroom curl up in a ball crying wow by myself in the bathroom just crying 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 probably for about like five minutes it was long enough for the uh, teen staff supervisor and um, my roommate to come in and check on me they had yeah. to check wow yeah yeah they came in they checked on me and um, Megan sat down next to me and Courtney, the supervisor sat next to me too. And I was just like, I told him what sucks is you don't like, there's no way uh, for you to understand what I'm going through. Cause they're right. both white. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There's no way to understand what I'm because people can have the attitude of like, Oh, you're overreacting from this. Like if I was in that situation, I wouldn't respond the way that, but I've never, you know what I mean? Like you're yeah. not ever in the situation of being in that. So for you to judge how somebody else is responding to a situation yes. that you never would have the ability to respond to is, is inhumane. That's like, that's, that's messed up. That's a lack of, yeah, complete it goes empathy. back to what I always say. And probably in some capacity in every episode is that you can't tell other people how to feel right about something. Um, you it's your responsibility to react to how somebody else feels about something and 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 i think the i think the ethical humane reasonable response is to validate other yeah. people's feelings mm-hmm. um even if you don't understand right i mean the, yes the white white culture would respond to that and say even like well-meaning you know people that identify as is very anti-racist would say oh you overreacted to that he just said a word right Right. yeah but who are they to tell you how to feel about that right yeah um when it goes back to that we need to focus we we really need to uh to zero in on the idea that we need to affirm each other's pain yeah Mm -hmm. i'm sorry to mean to talk over you you're fine um it kind of goes back to that email that we got at the beginning of I, I think that it's easy for somebody who's sitting away from a situation and say, well, if I was in that situation, if, you know, my church turned against me, if my wife did, or if I had a divorce, if I'd blah, 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 blah. Well, I wouldn't have left the faith. I wouldn't have done that. Yeah. Um, but but really, you don't understand the, the mindset that everybody's going through and what they're processing at the time and what that means to them and what other deep, deep, deep theological and yeah. logical things are going through their minds that yeah. you can't make that assumption. And what I, yeah, and on that note too, what I actually respected the most about um, what Courtney said. um, Of her not understanding what you're going through. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I told her like, you don't understand what I'm going through. And she actually said, you're right. We don't. And on paper, Mm -hmm. that sounds kind of harsh. Like somebody might be like, that's mean, but actually that was great. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, like she didn't try to be mm-hmm. like, no, yes, I do. She said, no, I, I'm, right. I'm sorry. Like, I don't understand. Because okay. well-meaning people don't always know what to say. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I, I ran into a situation recently where a friend of, I was talking to my friend about how I'm really making some big breakthroughs of going through the trauma that I went through and through therapy and all of this and like really understanding who Brady, 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 Brady is mm-hmm. at the very heart of me. Um, and my friend's response was, well, with anything with trauma, you know, the answer is just to be yourself. And it was this like very light, pithy thing that like, mm, yeah. I don't think he really understood the depth of what was, but I know him well enough to know you meant what was good. Yeah. Um, but sometimes it's just better to say, I don't understand that experience. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And, 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 you know, beyond that, open a dialogue and say, well, what about that? explain this to me and it, maybe they can't and that's fine yeah like yeah. maybe it's maybe there aren't words for it but mm-hmm. uh open a channel for understanding right don't don't uh it's very condescending to yeah. to uh try to explain away what somebody else is feeling yeah and also uh i think the best thing about like just acknowledging how they're feeling and just like being with them and holding space for them also like like uh, just being with them holding space for them is sometimes they don't feel like explaining to you what they're feeling and why they're feeling that Mm -hmm. way and yeah that's why i loved about courtney she saw i was in tears she shot she saw i was emotional i did later on talk to mike afterwards like with the tears in my eyes finally and like like i let him truly have it like you know with the tears in my eyes even then that was exhausting you know but she didn't ask me to explain myself and i think that's something that a lot of people of color especially in the church today now are constantly being asked to explain why you know why are these riots happening like why i'm really scared like why this why that it's like because the sole of your boot is on my fucking neck that is yeah. why, yeah, but yes. I can't say it to you because the sole of your boot is on my fucking neck, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you right. know? And so sometimes it's just like, dude, just let them feel, use common sense and just let them feel. And so that's, that's what I got from that experience. That's, you know, that's, great. that's super important because I feel like there is this, <clears throat> there's this dance that ha- that happens between the uh, extreme conservatism, the alt-right, white racism and... Mm-hmm and church right and it's like there are these spaces where it's really hard to tell the difference whether it's blue lives matter or you know uh just like debates over over michael brown over flando castile which obviously this week the non-indictment of the of the officer that killed flando castile right um eric garner was the that was the that was the the case that broke me in, oh, in terms yeah. of race like I couldn't oh I I still weep every time I watch that video and obviously th- this 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 tension uh has been going on for you know since literally the founding of America it's 400 years of of you know one one form of systematic racism or another right but um in recent in the most in the more recent years the the invention of the cell phone camera has allowed us to actually see things wow uh, yeah. firsthand mm-hmm. and and they become real and uh and, and we have this anger and we have these riots and we have you know black lives matter being associated with people breaking windows and even though that's not really the the you know purpose mm-hmm. of the movement and mm-hmm. things like that but uh, but the issue is, I read this really, this really good article by a, by a psychologist and I, I couldn't reference it. I would have to look it up, like dig it up. But, um, this psychologist wrote, wrote this article, um, in response to the Michael Brown riots after the non-indictment regarding that case, um, they said people engage in self-destructive behavior when they feel like they don't have a voice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that is exactly what you're talking about, right? Your boot is on my neck. I cannot respond. I mean, Eric Garner, like, I can't breathe is literally all I can say. Yeah. Right. And, and you're panicking. And, uh, and, and that panic is very real, right. right? I mean, and that's not something that, that, the, that whiteness will ever understand is this right. panic of literally I don't know – if I'm going to live through today because there is a system in place that is against me. Right. 
right? And and I don't have an outlet to say that right now. Um, and when I do, when something like Black Lives Matter happens and they're interrupting Hillary Clinton's, you know, stump speech yeah. and she's saying and she's disregarding their message it's it just becomes that much more obvious that there's no voice when yes. when even when we're screaming yes even when we're interrupting and screaming it's like oh well what you have to say is for another time and you're sort of like well when right when am i going to get when am i going to get a national stage and be on cnn live with breaking news and they'll hear me say my people are being destroyed by yeah. the American system. Right? What what changed yeah. me the most was the documentary on Netflix, 13th. Um, blew my mind. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that was the first time with my education of growing up where I did in a suburban white, you know, south of St. Louis place. Mm-hmm. Um, that was the first time that I really got educated with, oh, wow, this is obviously our system is in place to harm minorities and to keep them controlled you know and it disgusted me after watching that and i wrote a blog after it and the Mm -hmm. title of the blog was and it's the most honest thing i can say after saying after seeing this 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 movie was that um i'm happy after watching this that my son and i are white that's okay and it was the honest most honest thing i can say Mm -hmm. because the things that other family I mean I look at myself with my situation of I lost everything you know um and it's hard to rebuild after that and I couldn't imagine what it'd be like to rebuild generations and generations after generation yeah well what's messed up like in my like especially with with the way things are going now um and we'll get to later why that's kind of the main reason why I'm not going back to the church for a while um like after everything that happened with last year, with all the shootings that happen in a row, all mm-hmm. the shootings that happen in a row, like I used to be somebody who, who, um, um, like would say, Oh, I want to have kids. I want to get married. I want to be this successful artist. And I want all of it. I want all the Beyonce dreams, all of it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and after like seeing everything that's happened with the shootings and mm-hmm. like with like, you know, global warming and all that stuff, I was like, dude, I don't know if I want to bring, bring a kid into this world. Wow. Right. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. do I want to bring a Brown baby into this world? Right. Mm-hmm. And knowing that he might get shot and the person might get acquitted, hopefully by then they, you know, they would at least get acquitted. Right. I can't even say he won't won't be shot. Yeah. You know, because I just I look at I always tell my I look at photos of um, of all the all the lynchings that happened um, in the 30s and 40s Mm -hmm. that were just like huge parties huge mass picnics i look back at that and i you know at emmett till and i tell myself okay you know what things have gotten better things have gotten better i told myself things have gotten better and now just like seeing sure. philando castile just get acquitted um yeah. seeing 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 that um a female cop who, who who shot the guy in oklahoma just get acquitted yeah. i'm like they've changed in the sense that the murderer has to wear a uniform yeah, and the yeah. white church yeah. will stand by and silently watch it all. Statistically, right. absolutely. Yeah, statistically. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, You're I, absolutely. Right. I hate to always be the one. It's like, oh, but not everybody, because it gets it right. gets old. But but we, you are right. You it's absolutely recognized. Right. We yeah, recognize that on this podcast when we make generalizations um, for situations like this. It, but the the point there, is, there that, is a responsibility that needs yeah. to be taken. The point mm-hmm. is that there's a it's enough that there's a problem. Yes, right? mm-hmm. that's that's it's what a, we're saying. The tendency is to defend the police. Why? No, nobody. I don't think anybody can answer that question because and going back to because what I said they before, go through training because they're they're given a, a gun by the state because right. they have a badge because right. what does that say about their character? What if does that say the about Holy their Spirit of God is living inside of these people, changing them from the inside out, you should be ahead of the curve. You should be ahead of the curve. Yeah, and a lot of them they aren't straight and, up. And you have a great story about that, um, and that kind of had to do with your exit of the church. Um, I want to get to that when we take a, after this short break. Mm-hmm. We'll be right back in just a few minutes. Great. Do you have a story you want to tell us, or a question you want answered? Do you need advice on how to handle family members who are upset at you because you're wrestling with your beliefs or leaving your religion? Have you experienced some weird religious shit that you need to tell people that might actually get it? 
then contact us. Go to thelifeafter.org, all one word, and click the Contact Us page. Or Facebook us at facebook.com backslash thelifeafterorg. Or email us at info at thelifeafter.org. We would love to hear, hear from... Uh, let's do it together. Okay. One, two, three. We'd, We'd love, love to, to hear, hear from, from you. you. Or when you email us, send us a voice recording. We really like that too. Welcome back. Uh, Prisca, what were the, kind of the last steps of your, like, conv- okay, you you identify still as a Christian. Is that correct? Progressive Christian, yeah. Progressive Christian. Yeah. So what were kind of the last steps of what your, your um, what is it, stereotypical? Can I say that? Yeah, your stereotypical, stereotypical. Yeah. Like, um, I haven't been to the, in, in a, well, regularly in a church for about four years, four or five years. What led to that? Um. The big step was I used to be part of this um, at one of my churches. I used to be part of this uh, small group. It was called an artist collective and it was at the Kansas City Boiler Room. And it was this fantastic group. Oh, the Boiler Room. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So she I has some. Remember the Boiler Room. <laughs> yeah. Some of the influences of Jamie and overlap with, with yours because okay. IHOP is. A... Uh, yeah. So the Boiler Room, they had this really great artist collective and it was a community of people that, you know, we came together and. Uh, there weren't really any rules. Um, it was just be artists. Just be artists and talk about art and God and whatever. And it was fine. And our meetings were um, on Mondays. And then on Wednesdays, somebody would have dinner at their house and stuff. And it was like a really great, it was a really, it was a really fun time. Um, and that was actually where I learned about community and like what it really looks like. And it was beautiful. And mm-hmm. I remember, because um, uh, I knew I was never called to do um, quote unquote Christian um, theater or Christian art. Um, I was very much called to the uh, the uh, secular, the the secular world, and because that's just how my writing went. That's how my my uh, that's what I was attracted to. That's what I did. And so I remember I did this play, and um, I had to be in a threesome, or I didn't have to be. I could have said no. I didn't say no. I was in right. a. Th- <laughs> I was in a threesome. You had to consent to a threesome. Yes, I had to consent to a threesome. Twice. Uh, Yes. (laughs) That's a sixsome. I was I was on stage. I went so I told my mom first, and she was actually like she was she was annoyed at first, but then she was like okay, and she came. Right. Yeah, she wasn't like thrilled about it. What parent would be? But she (laughs) but she watched it anyway. Yeah, she came. It was actually kind of cool. Right. Um, and then I told uh my community about this, and uh, I was like okay, here we go. And they were all like, oh, great. Yeah. I draw things like that all the time. Right. Yeah. Yeah. For <laughs> yeah. Sure. Fantastic. Yeah. Oh, great. You know, I can't wait to come see the show. It was so. Yeah. Like art stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. yeah. We're yeah, like, oh, you're an sure. artist. That's fantastic. So right. am I moving on. It was, <laughs> it was so empowering and wonderful. And so I finally found my niche in the church. I finally found my people and they killed it. Um, what do you mean they killed it? They 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 discontinued it. I was at the meeting. The boiler room did. The boiler room okay, did. Okay. Um, the boiler room discontinued it, and I was at a meeting when it happened. I remember one of the guys saying, like, you know, hey, members of the church are really intimidated by by the artist collective, and they don't feel comfortable, and or not yeah, they don't feel comfortable. They they want to hang out, but they don't feel like they they're not welcome, and so because we don't talk to them or whatever. So you know what, we want to be part of the community. Okay. And of course, lo and behold, within like two months, like all the artists left. Right. Well, right, the right. the uh, the uh, single artists left. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the ones who were married had kids. Stuck yeah, yeah. So they still, yeah, they stuck around. Interesting. Yeah. I yeah. say that a lot, and, and it it's interesting because so many of our guests so far have either been divorced, or they're bisexual or gay, um, or they're people of color. I guess what I'm saying is we're a lot of us are just the outskirts. Sure. We don't fit mm-hmm. into that norm. There's like yes. that, that, that fear of difference, that xenophobia, yeah. that each one of us in one way or another, um, whether divorced, gay, black, whatever, yeah. Um, yeah. we're hitting on. And it seems that the people who, it's easier for them to stay within the church a lot of times are people who fit, who can camouflage themselves into everything. Yeah. But for the rest of us that are on the outside and to see how we are treated, um, we, we we can't reconcile that to, mm-hmm. to the teachings. Yeah. So what was that? And what was the racism like, though, for you? Like, let's say these mm-hmm. big situations like um, Donald Trump being mm-hmm. voted in or um, Donald Trump was my was my I'm not going to church. 
ever again. Really? Okay, so they, they stopped the collective. Oh, and then, sorry. Yeah, we, we, we jumped forward. Uh, yeah, yeah, what's the bridge between... Okay, <laughs> bridges between um, them closing out the collective and you... Yeah, having an election and so saying you're not going to do it anymore. They uh, um, they closed out they closed out the collective and eventually I didn't have my have my my people so I kind of just hung out and yeah I sat kind of just hung out I didn't go to church for a while I tried a few of them but they didn't fit well for me and then um, eventually I just kind of stopped going to church. Um, I preferred hanging out with my theater community. I mm-hmm. preferred hanging out with people who didn't like, you know, judge me based on like what show I was in. Um, and that was actually kind of nice. I preferred like having my Sundays to myself and I still like very much believed like in the spirituality and, and, and in, in the divine of Jesus and, and Jesus consciousness and all that stuff. Um, but Last year, I started considering, I was like, maybe I'll go back to church again. It's been like three years. I should probably mm-hmm. go back to church. Um, and the shooting started happening. Actually, 2015. The, shoot is, the shooting started happening. For, it doesn't happen first. The, you're talking about police shootings. The police yeah, shootings. Right. Yeah, the police shootings started happening. And Which first, didn't start happening. It started being publicized. <laughs> oh, right. yeah. We yeah. Had, like you said, we had the technology to see what yeah. was happening. Yeah, right, these times. right, yeah. So Ferguson happened and uh, yes. I was I was actually pretty understanding of like, you know, some all the, the all life matter movement. I was like, OK, mm-hmm. well. you're like 20 minutes from Ferguson. Do you know that? Oh, I know. Oh, yeah. I know. Yeah. I know where I am. Yeah. <laughs> I know exactly where Prescott's I am. from Kansas City. She's visiting us for the for the day. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, Ferguson happened and I was like, oh, fuck, this, sh- this shit sucks, yeah. you know, but like. Not but, but okay, I, I get like all lives matter and stuff. That's fine. And then it, gets, it kept happening and it kept happening and it right. kept happening. And last year it was Oklahoma. It was the guy who was shot in the street. And that's yes. when I was like, I do not give a fuck what you guys think anymore. I'm not explaining myself to you. Mm-hmm. I, I stayed in bed for like two days. Like depression, yeah, yeah. it hit me for like two days. How did the religious people in your life respond to this? <sighs> uh yeah i mean it's clearly i could see you you're upset yeah i am um it's it hurts when you have people who will yell at you um for being understanding of a of a thing like abortion Mm. and you will witness people wail and weep over abortion and pray in tongues over abortion, you know, or in my anger and ego wise, a group of fucking cells. Yeah. Yeah. But then you see somebody like you mm. shot down because he looks like somebody like you. Right. Mm-hmm. And you get messages from people saying you don't know what the situation. Wow. I still have as if you're yeah. still inferior in your understanding of what was going on. Yeah. Frisca. Wow. Yeah. And at some point I was just like, it's happening over and over and over and over again. And you're going to look at me and tell me you're pro-life and that you care about all lives when you can't even separate yourself from your fucking party. Right. And and um, your religion, because to you, your party is your religion. And you won't even look me in the eye. Somebody who this shit is affecting me. It's affecting. I got more messages from from, from, my, from my atheist, humanist friends or people just who don't go to the church anymore saying, hey, how are you doing? I didn't get a single message from a Christian. Right. Why? Why are the humanists always above the curve? <laughs> You know, just to be able to have that it's, empathy and practice. It's exactly it. what you've been saying, Brady. It's, yeah. it's a question. Where know? is the Holy Spirit in us? Where yeah. is the Holy Spirit? Where is the, where is... Because something's broken. Yes. I mean, we can't just make Clearly. excuses. Something is broken. It is obvious that those who claim to have the Holy Spirit in general are behind on these things. Yeah. And, yeah. and... You and I both noticed it in a different situation yeah. with, with Pulse. Oh, yeah. And I remember you posted something about it and I posted something where we, we came to realization that like after Pulse happened, you you don't see all these people who are 
they're fighting for, oh, there's a terrorist attack in Paris. Like, oh, let's all change our, our Facebook pages. Let's all talk about this or right. whatever. You don't see that when it happened with, with, with Pulse. I didn't see a single person from my my previous life, um, maybe minus one, if I remember correctly. Right. But I'm yeah. just really giving the benefit of the doubt here. Um, that even like, even acted like it, everybody else is just posting about like, oh, here are engagement pictures. So here, you know, my mom's doing this. Right. And it, it, it's, it doesn't affect people because of, if I, if I were Sherlock Holmes and I were to look at the clues, I would say because of xenophobia. Yeah. You are, you are fearful right. and less sympathetic. I think that's the way we should say it. It's not just you're not fearful always. You're less sympathetic with people who are different than you. Yeah. And um, I think that if the Holy Spirit was real, that he would need to intercede on that. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. but, it would be it would be clear. Mm-hmm. Yes. It would be it would be clear more even more so than than like the the ten, the belief is that the Holy Spirit is is more present and more uh, clear than your intellect right mm-hmm. like the holy spirit informs you on things that are that are like it, it gives you st- information on things that are uh, that are that you can't see that you're not capable of of understanding mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. And, and i know it should pl- be so clear it should be so clear and i know plenty of christians that would stand up for what is right and are ahead yeah. of the curve when yes. it comes to, to yeah. social rights absolutely. But, yeah, but my point of yes. that of saying is so we're a lot of the people who are claiming not to have the Holy Spirit. Right. And and I'm glad that those people are seen up and making, you know, waves in their in their community and seeing up for what's right. And I and I respect that. And even as in as a someone who doesn't believe the same as them, I'm gonna support those Christians and say, Hey, yeah. The Matthew Vines who are of the world and the the Kathy Baldwin, I can't even think of her last name, but she's part of the the uh, Reformation project that are like really fighting for LGBT rights. I'm yeah. going to stand behind them and say yes, 100. percent I'm behind them. Yeah, yeah. I'm oh yeah, them. absolutely. There are a pl- plenty of them like out there. Um, Shane Claiborne is somebody I think about right now. Shane Claiborne is yeah. He's, we mentioned him a lot in this podcast yeah. actually. Because <laughs> he's so great. He actually, he actually is he actually is pro life. Like, yeah, if we know what pro life really is in the in the truth in, in the, the truth sense, sense, right? Yeah, like the don't blow up brown people sense. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. We, I don't know. That's weird. <laughs> if you're pro life and anti blowing up brown people, that's weird. It's right. a big step. Um, right. Prisca, I'm I'm really uh, like I was really moved when you um expressed that feeling of of like these people look like me, but you'd rather defend this i this you'd rather defend pro life or you know mm-hmm. the anti abortion agenda i right? call it pro birth you feel yeah. yeah 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 you yes that's a much better description mm-hmm. you feel so driven about this issue right and that's fine if that's your if mm-hmm. that's what you believe that's good you yeah. feel driven about it but when an actual human that you can interact with that you can have a conversation with that just ate lunch that is out on the street getting shot by the police for no reason Mm -hmm. and you don't react that is incredible to me and i think it just occurred to me while we were talking that the reason i think the reason that the eric garner case is so it's so prominent to me and if if anybody needs a refresher that's the man that was uh that was actually strangled to death by the police the um, i can't breathe guy for selling yes i can't breathe for selling cigarettes without paying taxes on the cigarettes that he was selling Mm -hmm. um, on the sidewalk he was repeated i mean he repeated the phrase over and over i can't breathe i can't breathe i can't breathe and there's a video of this Mm -hmm. um, as the police are using a technique that's that's actually illegal um they're Mm -hmm. actually you know obstructing his ability to breathe that is not something that they're allowed to do and the phrase I can't breathe is just that says it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That says it all. I yeah. mean, like he didn't he wasn't speaking for every minority in the United States when he said when he was saying that he was trying mm-hmm. to save his life. But I can't breathe. Is that says it right. Yeah. It's it's you are wow. not allowing me wow. to yeah. ex- exercise my very basic human rights. Yeah. In this space. Yeah. I mean, I think about, um, I think about, um, cause for me, uh, like the big goodbye one, I, 
I think I mentioned it. I don't know. Um, the big goodbye one was the election, like goodbye to the church yep. for yeah, a while. Yeah. That was a big thing. And people and a friend of mine asked me, um, he asked me, he's like, why does it? Why? Why? Like, why? And I told him, like, it's weird being in a church where 80 percent we're knowing that 80 percent of that building voted for a man who uh, was backed by the Klan. And that's not like yeah. that's not like a rumor that you have to dig and dig and dig and dig and dig. It's right. like go to the Klan website and, and like read their letter. Yes. But <laughs> it's right there, yeah. you know, and that's weird. Who, who refused to, to renounce that that endorsement? Oh, also. yeah. 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 Like, well, I mean, the, the gaslighting is there. To, chose it's, to, quote, be indifferent about it. Right. Yeah. Right. And so like for me, like. I remember thinking, um, cause I'm, I'm a writer. I imagine things a lot, including different scenarios. I get in my head a lot. Um, I thought to myself, I'm like, dude, what if, what if I'm like driving around and I get pulled over and I get shot and it's me? How would they respond? Yeah. How would my friend well, right. quote well, unquote respond? Like right. how would, how would they respond? Like God, what would so happen? Yeah. And, or worst case scenario, because you know a few of us, we all we all went there in our heads. What if shit get, gets really we- gets real with with forty five? Like mm-hmm. what if forty five is present? Is yeah. not at the present, by the way. Right. Um, <laughs> but what if shit gets really like real with forty five? Like and there's who, and there's a there's a like how a conflict m- breaks out right? Yeah. Now. How many Corey Timbooms are gonna like be out yes. there? How many wow. Harry Tutmans are going to be out there? Yeah, yeah. How many Abraham Lincolns are going to be out there? Like, yeah. really? Because if you think about it, and history shows it, um, even during slavery and stuff, yeah, like, we like to we like to embrace, embrace, embrace the fact that the Quakers were Christians, and it was the Christians right. who stood against. It was the Quakers. It was right. the Quakers that were having right. to stand up against it the was like, Christians. It was this a section. A lot, it yeah, was this Christians small, a time, yeah, yeah, against other Christians. And and even during, um, I'm almost done, and even during like the civil rights movement, like it was like a small portion of like Christians. It wasn't just like everybody. For the most part, like a lot of like believers were really cool with just kind of th- the way things were, which is fine. It's understandable. Yeah. It's safe, but. Yeah. Hmm. you know that's that's really the way you put that is really is really poignant to me because um you you sort of asked the question like what if that was me what if i was pulled over for having uh my brake lights out Mm -hmm. and i was shot by the police um which is a very unfortunately very reasonable scenario in the current political situation or the current you know systematic situation and the uh, like it's sort of like how would your friends react and i would like to think like yes your religious friends would would be outraged right right like they would be upset about that but it's but then it's like why is that what it took yes right why does it have to be somebody that you know why why does the was eric garner a, a a an idiot was he just was he a brainless you know was he just a drone walking around selling cigarettes that had no value as a human being was Philando Castile, you know, some deadbeat dad that that didn't care about anything and only cared about himself and carried a firearm so he could shoot the police? You know, it's it's it, it, why why would it take Prisca? You know, right? Yeah. Why would it? Yeah. Why would it? Why does it have to be somebody you know? Why? Why? Well, it is goes human back to life? what it goes back to what Jamie talked about too in the episode about sexuality of, um, in one of her poems she mentions about women. Why? Why do we always? look at victims of sexual assault by the relationship that they have with men. Right. Oh, but that's the wife. That's the daughter. That's the, yes. the yeah. but you, you know what? Mm-hmm. You, you matter, Prisca, you matter. You matter as much as I do. And we have different color skin. We have different sexes, genders, whatever. Um, but you matter. And, and, and even more so because there's an emergency, you know, there's a, the, 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 the house is on fire if you're in a if you're in a house fire and people's lives are being threatened you don't casually leave and like yeah. drive off you cuz i'm going to go do you my own thing tell everyone in the house that the house is on fire yeah so that they don't lose their lives you react right and that's minorities in america that's the lgbt community that's yeah. 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 i mean the suicide rate in in the lgbt community is 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 astronomical and in the the, the homeless know. teenagers if i would have come out when i was younger i would have been homeless yeah it, absolutely yes yeah. absolutely yeah. yeah and it's it this is this is a real threat and we and we have to react <laughs> yeah mm-hmm. more more than like 
It's not like Brady gets pulled over by the police and we're outraged. It's it, Priska gets pulled over by, by the police and we're terrified and we have to react. Right. And this is something that yeah. us as Ochuck and I, you and I as non-Christians and Priska as a progressive Christian, this is something that we can work together with. Um, this is something that we have in common and mm-hmm. something that we mm-hmm. care about is fighting for these things. Yes. Um, we do need to wrap up before we do. Priska, I want you to tell me a little bit about what you're doing now with your writing and what your big projects are. Yeah. Um, so actually leaving um, the organized religion was probably a, the most freeing thing that I did creatively for me because I didn't have to worry about explaining myself to anybody except for, mm. except for family. But, you know, that's fine. That's always going to be there. <laughs> yeah, <right>. exactly. <laughs> um, so um, I've cr- I currently have uh, two major works in the in. in in the process uh this play called seven and ten it's about four uh which i read yeah yes. <laughs> yeah and it's it's definitely about it's about four christian uh um young christian people who uh they're all married well you know it's like two couples and then ryan and jenny who are not married have an affair with each other and so i kind of i'm working on um getting that mounted on stage and really like um uh getting that exposed to the world um my next script after that is called stained and it is the most vulgar thing i've written yeah and i love it (laughs) i literally have a i literally have a um um a character named Fuckboy. His name is Fuckboy. And it's about this writer who just, who hires this actor as her fuckboy, her, her, uh, her, uh, sex, yeah, her sex toy, basically. Sure. And like how we, how it goes from there and stuff. Okay. And it's actually really, it's hilarious. And it's actually really great. I was surprised at, 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 at the reading and how well it went. Good. Um, so yeah, that's what I'm working on right now and getting those things mounted and really like, especially with seven and 10 and seeing, um, because of this podcast, Brady and Chuck, because of this podcast, seeing how much, I don't want to say damage, but how much pain and damage, how much pain, uh, the human beings and organized religion have, have caused Mm -hmm. in, uh, just kind of exposing that truth with seven and 10 and really like telling everybody's story of just like okay what causes an affair in the right. in the church like what makes that happen an important question that nobody asks yeah nobody asks a lot e- like every church i've been to happened yeah it's yes. just a thing that happens right you know that's my family that's it's my like life humans you know? together have sexual feelings or something i don't know I, it's weird you know no no but it, no, no i think no, it no. helps only, if we just ignore them yeah right? exactly only yes. and, and only men have sexual feelings women do not women don't have sexual feelings i don't have a yeah. sexual feeling i've never dealt i've never i've never looked i've never look, look, looked at porn i know for a, i don't look at porn but, guys, <laughs> she's lying she's lying through her teeth <laughs> i'm looking at my phone right now yes yeah it's actually it's actually very uncomfortable for all of us <laughs> <laughs> Just go put that down. Yeah, but um, actually, I like I will say this, like to en- to end it. Um, like as far as like, especially for artists, I think both of you are artists too. I will look at both of you and say, um, we're sexual beings. It's fine. Yes. And we are super sensitive and super Love aware it. of all of it, the the negatives and the positives, the sexuality and the romance and all that stuff and like the racism and all the bullshit that's in this world. And it's fine. We don't have to ignore it. Yes. Really quick. Yeah. What is one thing that you would tell your younger self? Um, like Christian Prisca, who's in the middle of the white suburban culture, mm-hmm. Growing up in church, what would you tell her now? Just one thing. You're okay. Yeah. You'll be okay. Okay. Yeah. Everything you're feeling, all the insecurities you're feeling, um, all the triggers you're feeling, all the all the uncomfortability you're feeling right now, you're okay. Yes. And you're normal. Right. That's huge. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you so much for coming. Thanks, Prisca. Yes. Thank you, guys. This, this is great. This has been a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> In, uh, in very real. Yeah. Thank you very much for listening. Yeah. <laughs>
My friendship with Prisca has gone through a very long time and a lot of interesting situations in my life. She was telling earlier um, off the air about uh, being Facebook and MySpace friends with me during the big moments of my life of getting married, having a kid, um, my divorce, and coming out as gay, and then coming out again as somebody who is not a believer anymore. Um, And it's amazing to see the connection and the history there. Um, I hope you all had a good time and were able to glean something from what she had to say. Um, I know I learned a lot of how what's appropriate to joke about and what's not, and um, how to treat people and have empathy with people who are different than you. So much for listening. This is Brady Harden, and this has been The Life After. (laughs) 